Hello, welcome to our special live debate, Violent Britain, Gangs, Blades and Bullets. We're here at the community centre in Brixton, which tries to put troubled teens back on the right path by teaching them to box, and they're having quite a lot of success. We'll be finding out more about that in the next half hour. We're also going to be talking to some former gang members. We're going to be talking to politicians and to the assistant commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And I've asked them about what's behind the recent rise in violent crime and what can we do to make our streets safer. Well, the mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, has held a crisis summit with the Home Secretary today on how to tackle violent crime following a, a spike in the number of fatal stabbings and shootings in the capital. And he says government cuts have left too many holes. That's as a leaked Home Office document suggests police cuts have possibly contributed to a surge in violence. Well, let's just look at some of the figures. Here in London, more than 50 people have been killed since the start of this year alone, and most of those are tragically young. Well, I'm joined now by Pastor Lorraine Jones, whose son Dwayne was stabbed to death while he was trying to save another boy's life, and it's in his name that this centre has been built, and, and from small beginnings, you've had enormous success. Haven't you 400 kids a year coming through here? Yeah, we've got um, so many kids, and um, in all honesty, Jane, we're at a crisis point. Even though we've, we're helping so many kids, there's like hundreds and thousands of kids that are still at risk. But yes, my son started this boxing project in Angeltown, and you know I'm, I'm really thankful for the police, the Lambeth Police, Richard Warden and Sean Oxley. They literally took my hands and provided this space and said, "Look, we're going to help you." And they've been true to their word over three years now. Growing up, at, you know, with Dwayne. As a mum in, in the community, did you fear something like that could happen to him? Was it, was it in the back of your mind when he went out the house? Or did you always think, hang on, I've got a sensible boy here? Jane, I've, I've experienced the, the harshest brunt of what youth violence is, has, is doing. And Dwayne often came home to me, sometimes in tears, and he said, Mum, it's so dangerous out there. It's, it's, it, it's, it's so violent out there. And Jane, I... I didn't know how violent it was until Dwayne was killed. And as a mother, I, I, you know, I felt, why, how, why couldn't I grasp the seriousness of what he was saying? Maybe, I mean, what I'm doing now, I should have been doing then to advocate for the young people because literally there were no facilities. And I've experienced the harsh brunt of what my son repeatedly was telling me about the streets. So he, he was, you think, crying out. He was trying to get a message to you and to others about what his life is like. Do you think people are listening to the children now, though? He was, he was crying out, not just for himself, but for many others. I mean, my house was like a community centre because there were no community centres. So I often had loads of kids come into my home. I'd always feed them and find them on the sofa. And... The cries of the youth are not being heard to the magnitude that is needed. I mean, we're working relentlessly here, Jane, but we're bereaving another young boy in South London. Killed, found in the Thames. Another family reaching out to me, asking me for workers to support them. That's it. That's how it is now. Who do you blame? Who do I blame? Right now, it's not about blame. It's about us coming together and truly supporting the grassroots workers that have, are connected with the kids. We've got a new movement called the GAN that's guiding children in the right direction. And they were out in their numbers last night, over 100, making a stand. It's these groups that the government need to bring to the table, inject the resources so we can get this done. Lorraine, you're passionate about this and there's no surprise at all. Thank you very much. Thank We're you. going to be looking at some of that footage actually from uh, that gang's uh, meeting later in the programme. Well, let's look at the latest figures from the Home Office. Now, these show a significant spike in knife and gun crime offences reported in England and Wales. Knife crimes were up 21% last year compared to the same period in 2006. And nearly 7,000 offences with guns were committed last year, which is a rise of 20% on the year before. Now, that means that every 12 minutes of last year, someone was either the victim of either knife or gun crime. Well, let's talk to some of the youngsters that are seeing this on a daily basis. First of all, let's bring in Ali. Ali, I'm going to stop your boxing. Catch your breath. 
Ali Nuruddin, um, you're 16 and yeah. you're boxing here after <coughs> turning your life around recently. We've all got, we've also got some, some other guys that, that you know we're going to speak to first. Ali, do you first of all, gangs, this, this, this word gangs, yeah. a lot of us hear about it. What did it mean to you being in a gang? To be honest, I wasn't in a gang. But my uh, area, I should say, is gang affiliated. But so you, whilst you weren't in it, you were affected by it? I wouldn't really say affected by it. I just lived where those type of things was occurring, mm -hmm. if you like. What, what kind of things are you talking about that were, were a part of your life that you saw around you? Like, uh, I guess, gang violence and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think you got desensitised to the violence? Um, to be honest, I just kept my head low and I didn't really go out that much mm -hmm. um, to, to join in, in those things, those but, activities. But boxing's really helped. Yeah, boxing has really benefited me as a person, uh, mentally and physically. And it's kept me away from certain things, negative people. So. Okay. Thanks very much, Ali. Uh, let's bring in some of these other guys. Uh, this is Ansrullah Amadi, Ants, as he, as he likes to be known. Elijah, hi, nice to see you, Elijah. And also uh, Maya and Imani, who are here as well. Um, Ants, to you, first of all, you used to carry a knife. Yeah. You're not anymore. Why did you carry a knife? Well, mainly it was because of the protection of like, where I was, like where I was going to, and then the places that I was at, and then, and then the people I was affiliated with. So that's why. Did you ever have to use it? No. No. And what was it that made you stop carrying it? It was like, then I started, like, because then I started realising that it's not really right, like, the consequence uh, that I'm going to get, like, when I'm carrying it, I ain't really about that life, because I don't want to see myself, like, behind bars and, you know, doing a lot of time, like, seeing my mum going through all of that. Well, someone who has done, done a bit of time is, is Elijah. Um, what, what was your experience of, of being in a, in a gang like and what did you get out of it? Uh, I want to answer a different question. I want to more focus on the epidemic that's going on right now. So it's not whether these kids are in gangs or not. You have to understand they don't feel like they belong anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So they're going to... You don't call it ganging up, they just call it I'm with my peers. So that, that, that's what I'm trying to get at. You know, we, we call it gangs, and it's this word that's been used the whole time. Yeah. But what, in, in reality, what does it feel like? Is it, is it basically just you and your mates? It's, 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 it's your young, group of friends. If you're a young person in the world, and you're already scared of life, so you don't know if there's any future for you, you don't know if you're going to make it to 21, and you don't know, even if you do make it, if anything's going to prosper for you, if you can get a good job or a good career or have a good life, or even own your own house, all of those pressures are going to play on you. So that's when you stop valuing yourself and stop caring. And then if you're not valuing yourself, why am I going to value the person next to me if he disrespects me and I go and do something then you don't want to come, come and televise it now now that something's happened why you not deal with what I was going through before when I was feeling neglected or lonely or I'm suffering trauma I'm seeing people get stuck or young people do things and no one's caring to even treat me or talk to me or help me deal with what I'm going through they're just labeling me saying you're in a gang putting you in a pigeonhole sending you to prison and then just freezing the problem and then dealing with it later that's what you are doing so, you know, you, you're saying that, that people are being put in a box and almost ignored. Yes. Um, and back, back to you, this thing about, about being vulnerable and, and, and wanting help and, and society not being there for you. Did, you. did you feel that? Did you feel that there were places you could go to when you were younger and scared and carrying a knife? At that point, no, because I don't really know much about, like, you've... Cl well, I did know, but, like, no one was directing me to it. Like, no one actually pointed out, oh, go there, it could help you and that. So no one really pointed anything out to me at that point in that stage. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to the girls now, um, Imani and Maya. Um, got you here just to get a woman's perspective, really. Um, what's it like growing up with boys with knives around you? I mean, first of all, do you know any girls who carry knives? Um, I don't know any girls that carry knives, but when you grow up in a society where those are boys carrying knives, when you grow up with it, you get quite desensitised to it. You don't, it doesn't really affect us on the daily anymore. Like it's a norm mm -hmm. for us. Now, so it's not really like it really affects us. I know, a, I know a couple of girls that carry knives, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like I think because it's so normal in the society, like um, they just feel like if I have beef, I might as well just carry a knife because that's like that's the normal thing to do. Why would then just you know hash it out and just you know mm -hmm. talk and, it and, out? And briefly, we've, we've got some pol police, we've got some politicians here. Um, is there anything you think 
you ladies, first of all, that you would like the authorities to do that they're not doing now? Maybe support the young, youngs, as he was saying, like support them while they're low and while they feel vulnerable and help them to get their stuff there because once they're down, they need to make sure they've been brought up and make sure they're uplifted and helped in certain situations. Lots of people from just that, that, the stabbing and stuff, they're quiet from like poor homes and they, they don't have support and love at home. They need the support at the home for them to thrive and come successful and feel like I got worth it in me mm -hmm. and feel worth worth. Elijah, you're, you're nodding there. I mean, I agree with what, that, yeah. What, what questions would you like to put, if any, to the, to the police? It's not questions, it's more, you know, you lot need to start doing things differently. Because you lot are just police, like, so for the police, you lot are just policing, sending officers out there to stop and search random people. No one's going to take that as you lot are helping the cause. You lot are just, they're just, young people and people around there are going to just see you're harassing us. Uh, because we're in groups and we have nothing else to do, you're going to come harass us. Well, give them something to do. Don't just give them money in, at the youth clubs and then take the money when in the youth clubs are, are, are shut down. Give them projects and things that they can do that can reinvest in themselves and then they can go on and kind of make something out of themselves after these projects. Politicians and all that, I don't even know where to start with them. You lot just need to just re redirect the money. That's it. Whatever you lot are doing with the money right now or your resources is wrong. And whoever else, like any other services, you lot need to just understand young people are scared, they're traumatised, they're going through things that they don't even understand. So one, you need to understand, you never understand what a young person is feeling. That's okay. one thing you don't know. Elijah, let's put those points to them because we've got some of those people there that are responsible for policing and also uh, the powers that be. We've got the Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner, Martin Hewitt's here. Okay. Very good of you to come down. Also the Labour MP for Croydon Central, Sarah Jones, uh, who's also chair of the All Parliamentary Group on Knife Crime and the former Conservative MP for Enfield North, Nick Dubois, also an anti-knife campaigner. Um, Martin, here to you first of all. The message from these kids is loud and clear. The, the, the police don't understand them and the police going out and doing stop and search isn't going to solve the problem. I don't think... I don't think aggravating it. I don't think the police are going to solve the problem on their own. I mean, we don't just go out and do stop and search. It's really important to say that. I mean, we're heavily involved with this club and engaging with the community and engaging with young people is a really important part of what we do. But we do equally need to be out there and enforcing the law. We've seen this rise in knife crime. We've seen the rise in the number of injuries. And stop and search is a really important power in allowing us to take knives off the street and save lives. But I agree entirely. There's the point about a cohort of young people being desensitized to this kind of behavior and the carriage of knives is something that really concerns me. And this, I think, is a moment for all of us collectively to work together to try and deal with some of the things that, that the guys have already said are the challenges that they face growing up. Because we will keep policing and we will keep working and we've got lots of operational activity to deal with those people who are going out determined to be dangerous. But we need to be protecting everyone and we need to be finding ways for young people not to get themselves involved in this in the first place. Uh, Sarah Jones, we've got one of, the, one of these ladies from, from your constituency. Um, you know, they're saying they need support, they need stuff to do, they need community involvement. What, what are you doing as an MP to help these young people? Well, I mean, you could take what they just said and make it government policy, and, that, and that, yeah. that's what we should do. Young people actually have the answers to the problems that are affecting young people. That's the first thing to say, is we should listen to young people and do what they say they need, because they know. Um, I set up the all-party group. I became an MP last year. I set up the all-party group straight away because knife crime is a real, a real issue in Croydon, as it is in London, as it is across the country. And there are two parts of it. One is policing, which is super important, and one is how do we prevent knife crime in the first place and everything they've just said about giving young people that sense of self-worth, the support, the love um, and the guidance that they don't have at the moment because so many different services have been cut. So we're seeing in, in London, for example, an increase in exclusions in schools, quite a big increase. So if a kid is excluded from school for behavioural issues, often because they've got an undiagnosed mental health problem that nobody's picked up on and nobody's treating, then they go to a pupil referral unit, they meet people who are in the same situation and things flow from there and they get in trouble because they lose their way. And we're the adults, we should be there intervening. And it's for politicians now at this crisis point that thankfully the government has now woken up to that we should all go, right, this is the moment where we listen to young people and we do what they tell us mm. to do. Uh, 
no, fewer exclusions, longer school days is something other people have suggested as well. I wonder if any of you think that's a good idea. I mean, asking, asking young people to vote for more school has never, never, never seemed sensible. But in, in the sense of, of having wraparound care, having places that kids can go to if their parents are working long hours, would that not be something that you think would work and help? Maybe that would work, but it's about making sure they've got support in place and they can be able to just feel like not by themselves and making sure that there's places they can go and maybe youth centres and stuff like that, open, more open, more, more youth centres, and where people can just listen and not just judge them for young, for young people. I want people to listen. That's what I do. I want people to sit down with adults and just feel them to listen to what I've got to say and not think, oh, you're doing that. I just want you to listen. Just listen. And it might, I think lots more problems will be sorted out just by listening to this. Let's bring in Nick Dubois, uh, anti-knife crime campaigner. <coughs> do you think... The adults are listening. Do you think the authorities are listening at the moment? Well, I think we have to seize the moment. The, the horrible thing about the tragedy and this huge spike in uh, deaths is that it is on, back on the agenda big time. And if we seize that moment, and that's not just the politicians, I think it, is, it can be fueled by the politicians, they can drive it. But what they've got to do, and this is the difference, I think, Yes, bring in the strategies. I really welcome as well the commitment to new funding. I welcome the commitment to early intervention programmes. I welcome to people looking beyond just criminal justice and looking at it from mental health education. So, but what is still missing is that we are not reaching community groups because this solution will be solved from within the communities with the full support. So when you come to places like here, when you actually visit other p p pockets of early intervention, they need the support. The money has to filter to them and the services, and quite often it doesn't. What, and in terms of this money, 40 million was announced by Amber mm -hmm. right at the beginning of the week, talking about things like banning zombie knives, stopping knives being delivered to people's <clears throat> homes. I mean, does anyone here think that actually will make a difference? Um, no, I don't think it will make a difference. You lot are... So the young person has a knife, you're taking a knife away from them, that's what you're doing. You need to get to the young person and stop him from picking up the knife in the first place. Mm, that's where you lot are going wrong. And then you lot are just policing them, sending them to jail, mm. then they get jail, they have no treatment or no help in jail, then they come out worse. And then you lot are crying that there's an epidemic. Mm. You lot shouldn't be surprised it's this happens. No it's offense. It's about understanding why they pick up the knife and not just thinking, no, not, have, not having a knife. Why do you want to pick up a knife? Martin Hugh, the Police, Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner, um, a lot's been spoken about police numbers. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the figures, for example. Um, over the last 50% um, rise in imported incidents of violent crime mm -hmm. over the last decade in England and Wales. Meanwhile, uh, the same number of time, police officers have decreased by 20,000. Now, you know, a lot of people might say that's not linked, but a lot of people will argue that the PCSOs, the, the police support community officers, the people who are out in the community have gone as well. Aren't these the people that the young people should be able to talk to, should be there, will know the young people? This must be having an effect on what you're trying to do. There's no doubt that kind of community policing that you describe is absolutely critical to keeping us in contact with communities. Because even though London is huge, it's made up of small communities and small groups in and around the city. And we've committed to keeping those, those neighbourhood teams there, the kind of people who work with, with, with organisations like this. But I think the point that was just made is a really important one not to miss. I won't apologise for us taking knives off people because knives hurt people and kill people. But the point about that we've been making for a long time is what we've got to get to is a place where young people don't feel they either need to or they want to pick a knife up in the first place because that's where we've got to get to actually start preventing this. And that's the kind of work that we will do with all sorts of other groups and organisations to try and be out there with young people, giving them that option not to find themselves in that situation. There, there is a, we've got to deal with the criminality that is there. Too many people are getting hurt and we have to deal with that. But I take entirely the point that it can't just be that kind of, that kind of confrontational work. It's about the community work we do. But more importantly, it's about other people working in communities to give young people an opportunity to have a different life. But do you not concede that there must be a link between the numbers of violent crime and the numbers of police on the streets? Because kind of saying there isn't is almost insulting to the police, isn't it? It's almost uh, saying, actually, it makes no difference if there are police out there's there. There's no doubt. We've, we've undertaken significant cuts in policing across the country, and we've saved lots of money in London. But it's not a simple equation, and that's my nervousness. It's not a simple equation that less police equals more crime. This issue is more complicated than that, and the kind of conversation...
conversations that we're having here are, are more than just about the policing aspect. We, there's no doubt we are very stretched. In London we're very stretched at the moment for a whole range of different reasons. But we've been given additional money to deal with this problem and we're putting a lot of effort into this problem. But I don't want it to be oversimplified that it is just straightforwardly less police equals more crime because it's more complex than that. Indeed. Um, well, what can be done to help? Here with us now are some of the community workers who are involved in a number of projects to try to help uh, the young in this area. Uh, first of all, let's talk to Donna Sinclair. Um, hi, Donna. Um, you, you run the Options for Change support project for vulnerable families. Um, what do you think about what you've heard from, from the police and, and from politicians today? They're talking about addressing the solutions rather than changing policing on the streets. Do you think that's a sensible way forward? Yes, I do, um, but the police will not be able to succeed unless they're actually in the community, not just arresting, working with people who are doing their hands-on grassroots work. Um, the police also need to have social care providers beside them doing um, the things that are necessary well before that knife is picked up. What is necessary is getting into a household and making sure that the legislations that are there to make sure that these children matter and that their needs are supported and provided for is what we need alongside policing. But you, but you heard from the Assistant Commissioner there that, you know, that he believes in community projects like this, that the police support projects yeah. like this. It's, it's fantastic that we have someone with such a high rank in the police who believes in this but what we understand what, what we need is for government to also believe in what the police want to do i have been working very closely with uh, the police in an advisory capacity for a good seven years or more and um you know the police they do engage with the community to a point but do they have the resources to go out and implement what are discussed in these meetings in my experience most times it's no because they need their officers to be doing responding to that 999 call so they're actually they're actually working to deal with other crises but we are saying that this crisis now must be resourced. Communities must be engaged. I mean, I, I'd like to say that I'm coming from the page where the community are frustrated, really frustrated, because there are some fantastic ideas out there in terms of how we could work together. But how does ordinary members of the community who want to get involved be able to connect with the police and other service providers to make sure we're keeping young people safe. Okay, um, we're going to talk to Harry in a second, Harry Hudson there, but first let's bring in Stephen Brown because I know you've got a sort of linked point to that really. Yeah, you, you, you're from, um, you're, from the found, you're the founder of Stop Our Kids Being Killed on Our Streets yeah. and you've got lots of ideas but you don't think that authority is listening to you. The, the, for, the authority is not listening to us at all. They're here now, you the, talk the, to them. The authority is not listening to us at all, the MPs don't listen to us. Some of the police do listen but they, they, there's higher powers that says well we can't help them. They've got something going on in, in, in with Mr. Khan now. Where are other people that's on the route, 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 in the trenches, doing the hard work, on the street every day, getting guns and knives off the street? Where are we talking to these people so we can explain to you exactly how to get around this problem, exactly how to deal with this problem? They're not doing it. So you know what? We're going to have to do it ourselves. The community is going to have to do it ourselves. How do you get knives off kids? Well, you know what? It's, it's not about barking at kids. It's about engaging with them, listening to them. This is one people seem to understand. You can't bark at them. They're not going to hear, they're just going to go, yeah, cha. It's about listening to them, understanding what they want out of life, what they're scared of. How, fancy that you're going to school and you're running a gauntlet every day to go to school. You're running through estates where you're not supposed to be because there's other youths there. You shouldn't have to do it. You're supposed to go to school in peace. Remember, these are kids getting killed. Kids. It's not grown-ups getting killed, it's kids. And we've got to stop it. And the only way we can stop it now is the community. Because believe it or not, the MPs and the government is not listening to the real people at the grassroots doing the hard work. OK, well, let's speak to those now. Let's speak to the politicians and the MPs. You're not listening, Sarah, apparently. Well, um, the first, so I set up the All Party Group on Knife Crime and the first meeting we had was with 15 young kids who'd been in prison for different kinds of knife crime and we listened to them. And I think you're right, 
people don't listen enough, but I think we're getting there and we are starting to listen. And the most powerful things I've heard are from the mothers of, of kids who've been murdered, are from the local community groups that are doing amazing things with no money. Yeah. Organisations like in, in Croydon, we've got one called Gloves Not Guns, which is similar to, to here. They do fantastic work with young people, but it's our job, you're right, it's our job to step up now and to put the right levers in place. So the mother that I know of a kid who was murdered, her younger son is massively traumatised because of what's happened and he's not getting the mental health support he needs because the mental health services aren't there. So there are things that we as politicians need to do, but we need to start by listening to the community. You're absolutely right. Let's, let's just, sorry, I just want to bring Nick, Nick to Bar, uh, former Conservative MP. I mean, it, it, when you look at Amber Rudd and you look at this policy that she's announced, do you think she has any idea, truly, what life is like for, for kids like these growing up? In well, politicians can always do more by reaching out and being in the community. And, and Amber, the Home Secretary, came to my old constituency in 2017 and met with uh, a lady who had lost her child 10 years earlier and was a strong voice of the community and did say what she wanted and what she needed. The difference between saying it and government reacting, well, that's been hard. For seven years, I've been struggling to get groups into schools who will say, we don't have a knife crime problem. And we say, great, but we want your children not to have a knife crime problem. Let's get in there and talk to them. These are the groups on the ground where the government, by leading and insisting and driving a culture change, can actually give the local groups the opportunity to be heard. They're here, they know what's going on, and government can empower them more. Then I think we can start to make a difference. Uh, very briefly, Harry, because you use football to try and encourage kids out of trouble, don't you? Yeah. Hearing any solutions today? It's the right, the, the messages are right, but it's too late. It's, we're reacting now to the problem that's already here. It's so rife and... We were speaking before, we knew this was coming, it's now spiked because we've left the young people, we haven't listened to young people for such a long time and now we're having to do all the hard, it's doubly hard now when the problem is so rife in London and, and we need the community, community groups to be, to be funded but it's so hard, it's not easy for us and the detachment from where we are at the coalface to where government level is, is really drastic, <laughs> it's huge. So we've got, we've, we, have, we have some politicians here, we had the police here. What about any politicians who might be listening? What, what if Theresa May happened to be watching this oh. while she's having a sandwich this lunchtime? What would you say to her, Elijah? Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to put you on the spot. Quick, just, um, I would say, like, you really need to change your policies or your criteria of, I don't know how it works, or the fundings or whatnot, so then this community, the people on the community ground doing the work can get the funding and get access to resources, not follow trending epidemics, just a, a holistic, multi agency sort of criteria for funding for the whole of London where each organisation can take money out of it and do this and then coordinate with each other and help each other. Because at the, at the, what you're, you're not doing is you're, set, you're letting organisations just and communities and charities just do what they're doing. Like okay. you said, there was a um, gloves, not guns, is doing all right with no... That's not... No you, shouldn't, okay. you shouldn't be saying, oh, it's all right, it's good. That's not good. Good okay. is not what we need. We need something to be done. So if you know that charity Indeed. and you, you're in a position to do something, you personally can even... We're going to have to stop. We're out of time. Just um, it's all we've got time for. Um, thanks to all of you guys for joining us. Let's leave you with the images of some of those who've lost their lives on the streets of London in the last few months.